So John and I have been talking and uh, John and I have been both been selling real estate for quite a while together, sold thousands and thousands of homes. So we've got a lot of experience and we have been discussing, you know, I've been around for quite a few recessions. So, you know, I remember uh, my first one as an adult back in the uh, right around 1991. And then I was just getting into real estate at that time. And there's been several significant points. And of course, the biggest one that we can remember, of course, is 2008. John, uh, we can all remember 2008 very clearly, right? Yeah, um, I don't want to, but yeah, I remember it very <laughs> clearly. Yes. So, um, you know, a, a lot of people ask questions about, you know, how similar is this to 2008? Uh, 2008, really, it wasn't the straw that broke the camel's back. That was the anvil that fell on the camel. And then, uh, you know, in the cartoons, then the piano falls and everything just keeps on landing on it. So there were some significant factors there, but we can draw on experiences like that. And uh, we kind of came up with a couple of things that we wanted to help real estate agents out with today. And so kind of here's the, uh, what we'd like to discuss. We'd like you to be able to ask questions. We have a chat box down below that uh, you can take a look at. Uh, number one, when you're taking a look at something like this, what is a recession surplus? So we want to discuss the idea of a recession surplus and that kind of leads us into how do we in this market take advantage of that recession surplus? Secondly, what are the short and long-term opportunities to bulletproof your business? Uh, right now you got a lot of people putting money into, uh, you know, if you got extra cash, people are playing the market. Uh, but not all of us have that. We're just trying to get our business to make sure that we get through and out the other side. And we're praying every day that this ends and everybody goes back to business as usual. So how do we identify short and long-term opportunities? We're going to discuss some ideas for that. Uh, third, fear-based marketing. So right now, there's a consumer out there that's very fear-based. What are the things that we need to be saying and doing to be able to communicate with them and give them positive solutions? So we're going to discuss that. And then uh, lastly, what are some uh, strategies for cutting costs to make sure that your business survives through uh, what's going on right now? Uh, so that, let's go ahead and kind of um, start right at the top. So with that said, let's kind of start at the top. Uh, a recession surplus. So whenever we're looking at buyers and sellers, we're always looking at the same factors, which are supply and demand. Now, demand usually keeps going at a specific pace, but if there is a recession, what happens is, is buyers don't have any consumer confidence and they decide for a while not to buy. But what's fascinating and interesting right now is if you're watching the amount of people that are going onto the internet because they're sitting at home with nothing else to do, they are still looking at houses, which means the buyers are there. So a recession surplus is simply a pent up demand of buyers that are going to hit the market at some specific point once consumer confidence returns. So uh, John, have I done a pretty good job of uh, explaining what a recession surplus is or, or do you have anything that, uh, any thoughts on that? That's pretty much it uh, with the recession surplus where there's still gonna be sellers who wants to move and, um, but there's also buyers who are dragging their feet. So because of that, there will be a surplus once, uh, once it's uncertainty. And it's really caused by the uncertainty of the market. You know, right. uh, back in 2008, and actually I, I did a video about this just a few minutes ago. Back in 2008, just off, out of nowhere, the majority of the market couldn't qualify for a mortgage anymore. And of course, that hurt the market immediately. And the problem was there were so many homes on the market when that happened. So with our current market condition right now, we've seen... Uh, such low inventory since January 1st, like all year long, we've had inventory problem. So when the market, when buyers start to drag their feet now, the market is actually in a good place where it can actually, uh, I hate to say it, but it can, it can support less buyers because there's so little homes on the market anyways. Uh, we're at 50% or so of how many homes were on the market last year. Mm -hmm. Now, that, those are some interesting comments because really when you take a look at the amount of uh, inventory that's sitting there, it's going to be, the people that have to sell, have to sell. And right. so that inventory is gonna remain there. There's just a reduced demand. So I, I think the next thing that if w there was a strategy that should be employed, and it really is just two words, it's stockpiling buyers. 
So what are uh, things in your business that you can be focusing right on right now to start stockpiling buyers? So John, what are your uh, thoughts or strategies on where, where, what you're looking to do? Because if you're looking at a buyer that has a lack of consumer confidence, and if we go all the way back to 08, we actually didn't have people that could buy. Because if you remember what happened, what happened when the subprime market crashed, everybody reset all the lending and loan limits all the way back up to the top. So if you did not have an A++ credit score, you couldn't get a loan because everybody was trying to figure out what went wrong. And, you know, it didn't take a uh, rocket scientist to figure that out. All of us on the ground here knew what went wrong. They were giving loans on top of loans on top of loans. I mean, some people owned three houses and they were no doc. Uh, isn't that right, John? Actually, sure. you could buy a house with no documentation. No income, no assets, no documentation, no verification. No verification. Um, it was no, no surprise the market crashed, you know? Right. There were so many buyers who couldn't qualify for a loan who was getting loans. Right. So we're not really, we don't have that now. So we do have buyers that are still sitting here. So what are the strategies that you can employ in a business to be able to start stockpiling your buyers so that they're ready when it's time to go uh, let's go ahead and say venture back out there into public again. So for me, it's, it's like top of mind awareness. Mm -hmm. You know, people are looking for a calming voice. People are looking for people who actually know what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, what, what I find is that if, if you as a real estate agent right now freaks out, all of your clients are going to be freaking out. But vice versa, if you as a real estate agent, you take authority and you're like, hey, it's going to be okay. I'm going to give you updates every single day. I'm going to be here for you. Guess what's going to happen? Your buyer's going to be looking at you for answers. Your clients, not just buyers, your buyers and your sellers are going to be looking at you as, as if, oh, you know the answer. Um, I'm going to check with you. I'm going to start ignoring CNN. I'm going to check with you because you're the authority. So this is a great opportunity for you to be top of mind on, with all of the buyers and, and going on Facebook and doing videos and then sharing that. Um, and if you have your sphere of influence who are already listening to you and listening to your advice, make sure you, you, uh, you're in front of them, right? And then they'll, hopefully they'll be telling their friends also, hey, listen to my real estate agent. Here's what he or she had said this morning about what's going on in the real estate market. I think it's a great opportunity right now to be stockpiling buyers because buyers don't know where to look for answers. Mm -hmm. So if you're, the, if you're the woman or the man who has the answers, and the thing is the answer is not, oh, everything's going to be okay, let's wait and see. No, no, give data, give information, be the resource, right? And if you're the one who's, who has that information and they will be looking to you for answers, um, including just you might be the person who's just going to calm them down and tell them, hey, everything will be all right, and then you give them updates once a week or a couple times a week, and then when they're ready, and, and here's, here's why I think it's important. One of my biggest beliefs is that people don't remember what you say anyways, right? People don't remember what you say. People don't remember what you do. At the end of this conversation today, some of you will not remember anything I just said, but you will remember how I made you feel. And that's the same thing with your clients, your people, your followers, the people in your sphere. They may not remember what you just said, but they will remember how you made them feel. If you made them feel safe, and that's one of the key words that I find people are, are looking for right now is how can I feel safe? If you're the agent who can make people feel safe, they will come to you. You will attract people to you. That's good. That's good. So when we're looking at stockpiling buyers and John's talking about being a resource, I'd like to go ahead and share something that I learned years ago. And this came all the way back uh, from the father of marketing, Dan Kennedy. So if you've never read anything about marketing in, in, in our second bullet point, I want to get a little bit into the things that we want to project into learning what we know and what we don't know. So what are the things that we don't know and how do we find those out during this time? We're going to get into that, but here's one of them and go ahead and write this author down there. If you've got your little notepad or if you're typing on your phone, Dan Kennedy is somebody to follow in the marketing world to understand uh, why do the consumers respond to things? What do the consumers respond to? Wouldn't you like to have a better handle on what are the things that you should be saying and doing to be able to get your consumers? Well, let's go ahead and say your sphere, 
the people that you know when you speak, what are the things that you should be saying? And I'm going to go ahead and give you Dan Kennedy's formula for that. And it really is just three words. So everything starts with a problem. So if you think about every single infomercial that exists, what does the infomercial start with? Well, there's a problem that existed. And then there's the second part, which is the solution. Somebody invented something. So we've all heard the, the statement, necessity is the mother of invention. There are things that are going to be invented right now that we see in futuristic movies. You know, we see, you know, uh, John, you see those movies where people walk in as a hologram and they're all in a meeting in the same meeting room, but they're all holograms. What a great opportunity to so go ahead and invent that because right now people could be using that. What are the things that we're looking at to solve the problems that our consumers have? So our consumers have specific problems. They have a fear of what? They have a fear specifically of the things that are going on that we can go ahead and key on and come up with solutions. Now, when we're coming up with solutions, that means you need to be broad in your approaches to gaining knowledge and information. If you just watch CNN, what is your viewpoint going to be? If you just watch Fox News, what is your viewpoint going to be? If you only read uh, one particular source, that's all you're going to know. Uh, me, I'm, I consider myself a centrist, and I'm looking to gain knowledge and information from everywhere. So I cannot limit myself to sources. I want sources that come from one side, sources that come from the other, and sources that come from the middle. So I'm constantly reading. So what are your sources of knowledge and information? Um, John, one of the positive sources that you follow is, that really is uplifting, and I think you shared a video about this yesterday, Tony Robbins. That was a fantastic video on hope, wasn't it? It was. It was. Yeah. And just be it, careful, really, like uh, what, what's influencing you today, you know, because there are so many bad news out there mm -hmm. that if you don't filter what you allow – uh, into your system, uh, then what, what's going to come out of your system is going to be negative too. So I'm very careful. I'm very careful as to who I listen to. Right. So what goes in will come out. Yes. All right. So that leads us to the third part, uh, problem, solution, and then benefit. So when you come up with solutions to solve the problems that exist, and the problems aren't just fear, a uh, problem could be I want to get out and possibly see some houses, but I can't do it in this environment. What do I do? You know, I've seen people online doing virtual showings. I've seen virtual open houses. I've seen virtual uh, calls. Right now, John, you're having a lot of virtual meetings with uh, your potential buyers, correct? Uh, correct. And actually, I just had a homeowner email me um, two minutes before the, this, this webinar started, and she wants to sell her house. And I don't want to go to her house. So we're going to do this virtually. Going to do the whole thing virtually? Yes. And I have another one later today. We, like we have three sellers who just contacted us in the last 24 hours and they're all going to, it's all going to be virtual. All going to be virtual. So you've probably had to invent or create a process for a virtual listing appointment then, haven't you? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so you're going to, you're, you're, you're inventing on the fly as you do the, the, the first one here. Uh, somebody's going to have to walk through and show you the house. Uh, and then you're going to have to talk with them face to face. And, and I do have to say this, being proficient in a forum like this is highly important. Uh, the telephone doesn't do the same thing as a face to face conversation doesn't. I think this helps uh, to accomplish that, wouldn't you say? I would say so. Like people, people prefer face to face. So this is as close to face to face as we're going to get for now. <laughs> for now, yes, that's what we're going to get. All right. So, uh, that kind of lets us take a look at problem, solution, and benefit. How does the solution that you're proposing make their life better, easier? And if you can quantify things by looking at the consumer and what they need, you're going to start to invent. You're going to start to create. You're going to start to think about things that can solve consumers' problems, and you're going to talk about them during this time where, um, you know, the alternative is just sitting around wringing our hands and just going, oh my, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? So that's why we wanted to have this meeting today to talk about specific solutions. So that's number one is going to be our buyers, but number two is going to be our sellers. So what are we thinking about in prepping our sellers? And let's go ahead and call it D-Day. D-Day is the day when everybody goes back on the market and buyers hit the market. 
when we're taking a look at the numbers for the virus and we start to see them come down, everybody's going to start to say, all right, we beat it, we're over. Well, maybe not everybody, but a significant portion of people are going to go back to business as usual, and we're going to see an influx of people hitting the market. Now, up until then, John, what percentage of sellers would you say that you meet with that I would say need two to four weeks worth of prep time to get their house on the market? Three out of four. Three out of four? Yeah. If not longer, they may need more than you know, two to four weeks. Some, some people need more than a month to get the house ready. But most, the majority of the sellers that we meet with, they're mm-hmm. not, their house is not ready to go on the market today. Mm-hmm. Let's just put it that way. And like 90% of the sellers we meet with, mm-hmm. probably the house is not ready to go on the market immediately. Mm-hmm. So John, you're, uh, you're still coaching and you coach agents who have a lot of transactions all across the country. Uh, what, are you, what are you finding as far as people in different cities what, 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 are, what kind of advice are you giving them on corralling your sellers to go ahead and have meetings to prep them? Kind of the same thing that you're doing today with meeting with sellers and, and mm-hmm. doing it all online? So we're, we're, everybody's getting uh, homeowners and sellers calling and asking, like, what should I do? Mm-hmm. Should I just wait? Like, should we just press the pause button and not do anything for the next month or two or three or four months? Mm-hmm. And the answer is no. You know, the end of the day, you still have to get your house ready. So we're giving advice uh, to all of our coaching students, to all of our agents, and also to our, for all of our homeowners who are uh, mm-hmm. thinking of moving. Oh, number one, we changed the words. So it used to be like, hey, are you thinking of selling? Well, nobody's thinking of selling, but there are people who needs to move. So we're asking different questions because if you ask better questions, you get better answers. So now we're asking, hey, do you actually, do you need to move? If you need to move, let's get your house ready so we can actually put it in the best uh, situation, the best position for it to be able to be moved when you actually need to move. Because a lot of people think, oh, uh, this is just an event. Like they just snap their finger and the next thing they know, um, they're, they're another success story of a home that sold in one day. But for all the homes that sold in one day or in a week or two weeks, what you don't hear, what you don't see is the prep work that goes along with it right? It's, it could be two, three weeks. It could be two, three months. We have a home coming on the market in Silver Spring right now. That took a whole year of prep work wow. just because there, it was just set, such in a bad condition. And we did, we had to go through the court and it was a whole year's worth of prep work. And um, I want to give a shout out to Georgia for, for manning all that. Um, but so we're telling all of our sellers right now, Hey, if do you need to move? And if the answer is yes, you do need to move. When do you have to be moved by? And then let's get the house ready so that when the house is actually ready, we can determine if that moment in time is the best time to go on the market or at that point, should we wait a little bit longer? Okay. Because what's the worst thing that can happen is they put, they press the pause button, they wait and wait. And a lot of us have seen that before, right? Like our client says, mm-hmm. let's just wait. And then they wait and wait and wait. And then the best time to go on the market happens and all this uncertainty is gone and, and buyers are looking mm-hmm. again and homes are selling just like that. And they miss that opportunity because their house isn't ready. And at that point they're like, Oh, let's get the house ready. And it took them a month. And then they missed that. F- they missed the moment. Right. The best time to hit it is going to be when all that demand hits. Correct. And yeah. so what we're doing now is we're giving advice. Let's get the house ready so that when the uncertainty clears up, people are excited again, people have confidence again in the market, your house is the first home available. Right. Now, even right now, because inventory is lower, we're still seeing buyers coming in, being able to, um, to, to look at properties, but inventory has dropped down because of people stopping. Some people are not wanting people to come in and show their houses, right? Yeah, some people are. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. So the two things we've looked at so far is first off, what are the ways that we can stockpile buyers and what are the ways that we can prep our sellers for that day when everybody returns to the market? Uh, What I'd kind of like to open up to now is the short and long-term opportunities that that we're looking at in front of us to bulletproof our business. And here's the idea. Instead of just sitting around, which just uh, feeds into the fear, it feeds into the hopelessness, what are the things that we could be doing to stay busy? Who are the people that we can bring hope to? Our buyers and our sellers and our pipelines are people we can consistently be talking to, be in touch with, be a resource to let them know. So keeping busy, 
uh, is a major part of overcoming anything that you're feeling inside that's keeping you in a state of hopelessness. So when we're looking at this next part of the list here, this is really good because now we've got some things here that we can do. So let's start off by talking about John to you. And like I said before, uh, you and I both coach with a lot of agents across the country and, and help them build up their businesses. What does it mean to you or do you think to most people to bulletproof your business? I think to bulletproof your business is a, a business that's recession proof. Okay. You know, um, and to have a business that's re recession proof, uh, you need to know what people are in fear of, what people need, what people want, what people love. Mm -hmm. And then that should be your, your message every single day to all of your potential clients. Mm -hmm. and, and then to have a business that's recession proof to me is a business that's run by systems. Because right. if you have a business that's run by people, um, then you may have an operator error one day mm -hmm. and you have a system to back it up. So the, the, the first kind of key here is we're calling this a business. Now, would you say that most real estate agents have a business or they have a career that they've chosen that kind of runs their life? Uh, they have a career, they have a career or they have a job, right? So um, one of the things I've learned is that if your business depends on you to run it, you have a job. You don't have a business. Right. So there's a big difference when we say business. And that's a lot of the, uh, you know, I appreciate you uh, coming on and sharing some of your expertise on that today. And that kind of leads us into short term prep. When we're looking at short term prep, I think the first step is, and I would write this down, everybody write this down. I, I say this to more agents, I think, than I say anything else. You have to learn how to spend time working on your business instead of in it. Most real estate agents spend 100% of their time working in their business and so they never get a chance to create a business. They never get a chance to work on it and build it. Uh, what if you could spend, let's go ahead and say two hours a week in your marketing department. You had a marketing department for your business where you looked at, what am I doing to create new business? Would that change your business? Of course it would. Uh, John, you have this discussion with people a lot. What, what is, uh, you made a transition. I think you said it's been quite a few years now from working on your business to working uh, in your business as well. I'm sorry, vice versa. Mm -hmm. what, what, what year was that? And uh, kind of contrast the difference between the two uh, from being a regular real estate agent who just had a career to turning it into a business. How, how did that start? So we were actually expecting our first child, our first uh, daughter back in 2013. It was May, 2013. And I made a decision that I wanted to be somebody who's available for my family. Mm -hmm. you know, I've seen a lot of people in, in real estate make a lot of money, but then uh, they just weren't available. And uh, I don't want to be that dad. So that's the backstory behind it. It's like, I want to be the dad that was home to be, so I can play with my kids and see mm -hmm. them grow up. So I created the team and <laughs> the Leahy group was birthed out of that desire. You know, we talked about, you know, thinking grow rich and desire is one of the things mm -hmm. that's where desire came from. Like, I want to be, I want to be the dad that was home. I want to be an awesome dad. And so, um, and so I'm, I met Jerry, one of our agents, one of my partners now um, back in 2013. And I met Isti, one of um, <laughs> our partners now. And um, we decided to partner up. And we created a team. And really, the, the thing behind it was uh, I just had too many clients to take care of them by myself. Mm -hmm. And I remember, you know, heading to the hospital uh, back in 2013 as uh, my daughter was, you know, was, was due and able to call Jerry and be like, hey, Jerry, um, can you take care of my clients? Right. And, um, and it's, it's, it's just been amazing. And so that's, that's just one part of it, you know, and you know, I still remember also before the whole thing, before the teams uh, was created, before it became a business, mm -hmm. uh, it was hard for me to go on, uh, on trips and to go on vacations and even going on conferences. You know, if you go to real estate conferences, you'll see a whole bunch of agents on their phone, like working, mm -hmm. like they're not learning because they're always on call working. They're on the yeah, phone. I think a good question is this. Hallway, like answering yeah. calls and responding to emails and they're not actually listening inside. Uh, so just being able to build a business where each one of us, we can't all do this alone. You know, mm -hmm. we're all playing a separate part in the, in the transaction, uh, which frees us up to also do the best job possible. Right. 
No, it does. So if we're learning how to work on our business instead of in it, let's go ahead and share. Uh, you and I years ago got involved with a system that helped us understand that there's only three things that we can do to grow our business. Yep. All right. So what are those three things? Uh, you increase the number of transactions. Okay. So sell more homes. All right. Uh, you can also just make more money per home. So per transaction, okay. increase, so increase the, size, the, the size of the, the sale. size of your sale. Yeah. Right. Uh, so you can charge more and make more. Okay. And the, the third thing is you can, uh, you can shorten the period of time where people come back to you. Okay. So, so for example, you in our do areas, spend, oh, go ahead. seven to eight years for one home buyer to come back to sell their home. Mm -hmm. But if you shorten that period of time and short, shorten the gap, they come back every two, three years, not to sell their home and buy another home, but what if they can come back and uh, in, invest in properties? Uh, mm -hmm. What if they just refer you more people? So there are, those are the three things that we focus on all the time. It's like selling more homes, uh, making more money per transaction and also increasing or, or shortening the gap in, in how soon we see the same people over and over again. Okay. All right. So when you're focused on those, now you have something to focus on. Then you look at the different parts of your business and really you break that down into six different categories. The first one is going to be lead generation. It's a marketing department. It's specific time spent every single week looking at what do I have running anywhere to be able to generate business. And, and it's problematic because most real estate agents really do believe that if I don't have a listing, I don't have anything to market. Isn't that right? That's, uh, that's how people look at it, yes. Yeah, so um, when we're talking about working on your business, understanding that there is a specific department that you are in charge of, it, um, I, I like to tell people if you uh, went out and started a uh, cell phone store, you talk to your uh, significant other and one day you start a cell phone store you think you're in the business of selling phones so you set up all the store you put the phones on the wall you put a cash register right there in the middle of the store and you sit down on a chair and you're waiting well at this point you're still not making money why you're not in the business of selling phones you're in the business of making people walk in the door and buy a phone so we're in the same business here so a significant portion of your time has to be spent or a specific portion, maybe not significant. You have to spend time figuring out what am I doing to bring in business, whether that's through my sphere and activating my sphere. Uh, and that's really uh, uh, a, was a game changer for both my business and John's. Wouldn't you say, John? I would say so, yeah. Yeah. So after you do that, now you have a process in place for how you convert those leads into appointments into face-to-face -face meetings now if we're going to convert them to face-to-face -face meetings we have to have something to offer them so here's where a lot of agents get stuck they offer the same thing that everybody else offers all right so this was a great opportunity to go ahead and quantify what your value proposition is to the consumer uh, most of us as real estate agents, we bring a lot of value to the table, but it's really not quantified. Uh, if you were to somebody go ahead and type in the chat box right now, how many points uh, are, would be if you wrote down everything that you did for a buyer? Go ahead and write in the chat box how many things from the time you start working with a buyer to the time you go to closing, how many different things, you, your admin, uh, or if it's all you, what do you do for a buyer? Uh, John, do you, do you know that number specifically? You probably don't know an exact number, but there's a lot of things that happen between those two, right? It's probably over 70. It's over 70. I mean, I okay. just created a new checklist today for uh, every time we release a new video uh -huh. for marketing. And um, let me check my spreadsheet. I think it's like 34 things has to happen for one video. 34. Okay. Yeah. So, so you've quantified that. And yep. not only that, you're using this time right now to be able to stay busy. Yes. So, uh, uh, 144. E, e Will has 144 things on his checklist from start to finish. Now, do you think that a buyer would want to know that? Absolutely. Do you think not only would a buyer want to know that there's 144, but what they are and what the most, uh, how they benefit their life? Remember, what I told you. Problem, solution, benefit. How many things on that list benefit the consumer and make their life easier? 
well, gosh, I'm going to help them do the inspection. I'm going to negotiate the inspection for them. If there's repairs, I'm going to help them do those things. Are those things quantified? So once you've made, uh, I've gotten a lead, the second step in a business system, excuse me, is to turn that lead into a meeting where you can quantify, where you can deliver a presentation of value to a consumer. Uh, what's, uh, what's the next step in creating a viable business or spending time working on your business, John? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Oh, the next step. Um, on, this, for, so, on, the, on the business plan? Yeah, on the business plan, we turn, got, got the lead. There's the lead generation, then there's a sift and sort. We automatically- Oh, that's right, I kind of left out sift and sort. Yeah, we gotta make sure we, we spend time with the ones who are actually ready. Okay. So you're trying to sift and sort. So you're getting to the best leads first. Of course, that's now business. Mm -hmm. uh, people buying in the next zero to three months who want to be able to spend your time on those and not lose time working too hard with somebody that's buying in a year or somebody with unrealistic expectations. Then we make an offer, an offer of value. And then we get face to face and give a presentation. And we're, our goal is we want the thumbs up. We want the consumer to say, that's fantastic. And in your experience, in my experience, when you give a presentation of value, um, I'm going to go ahead and let you brag a little bit, John. The average seller that you put on the market, uh, you've already probably, uh, how many sellers have you already sold this year? Uh, 15. About 15? Okay. Maybe 20. 20. Okay. Uh, what's your average uh, listing commission that they decide to pay you for your value proposition that you're giving them? Uh, 7%. So you get on average 7%. Yeah. So uh, this leads to one of my favorite quotes, which is cost is only a factor in the absence of value. Consumers don't want the cheapest thing on the shelf. They want something of value. And if you quantify your value, what you bring to the table, people will want to pay for it. So this is a great time to go ahead and spend digging in and quantifying the value that you have uh, as a real estate agent, both on the listing side and on the, on the buying. All right. So um, let's go ahead and talk about the next step on our list. And that is going to be long-term prep. So when we're looking at more long-term prep to get our business where it needs to be, that's going to start by answering a very important question. And that is, you have to start figuring out what you don't know about your business so you can learn it. And this is a tough one because uh, what's the saying, John, you don't know what it is that you don't know. Yep. You don't know what you don't know. And so, go ahead. What, what I was going to ask you is what are the things when you coach with or help an agent put their business together, what are the kind of things that you ask them to help them identify the things in their business that they should be looking at? Um, not just in their business, Let's go ahead and say in themselves to understand what it is that they don't know so that they can learn it. I think it starts with like, where, where's your business coming from? Okay. Because then we want to identify what they're actually good at. We focus okay. on what they're good at and how to make it better. So if I said my business is doing really well with sphere of influence, I know that that's doing well. Yeah. Okay. And so Probably. the question is, uh, so what, what are you currently doing to get your sphere of influence to recognize you, to remember you? Are you getting referrals by accident? Are you actually asking for referrals? Is there a systematic way you're asking for referrals? Most people, they just get referrals by accident, mm -hmm. which is good. I mean, if, if you're getting enough referrals by accident just because people remember you and you're, you're memorable and you're getting enough business out of that, cheers to you. Like, that's great. But what if you have a systematic way of asking for referrals and a systematic way on a schedule where people sees you either every other day or once a week or once a month and it becomes systematic where it's predictable. Mm -hmm. Then if, if the system, and this is one of my biggest beliefs, if a system is followed, a proven system is followed, the, the outcome is predictable. And if you're, if you're saying like, oh, I'm getting referrals now, but my referrals are not predictable, meaning that one season I'll get like four, the next season I get zero, the next season I get one, that's mm -hmm. not a predictable system, right? So um, we, would, we, would, we would have to systemize it. We have to find a way to, uh, to make sure that people are referring you business for a reason, not just by accident, not just because, oh, this person reminded me of so-and-so, so I'm going to, you know, contact that agent and refer this person to that agent. Um, what can we do to systematically do it so that every single week, you know, you're getting one referral. Mm -hmm. 
You know what, John? I love, uh, I've seen your class before. I think you taught it to uh, about a thousand agents down in Orlando at a conference on uh, social media and your strategy, which involves about, a, I think it was a six or seven different step approach uh, to the things that you utilize or, or the messages that you, you send out. And then you automate that process by um, em employing or implementing other people to, uh, to do that, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. So pretty fascinating when you start to think about all of the possibilities, because I, I think our number one uh, complaint is, well, I just don't have enough time. Well, we probably can't say that right now. So we have a lot of time to be able to start thinking about organizing our business in specific ways. So social media can be one of those. Mm -hmm. um, when I say figure out what you don't, don't know and learn it, I want to go ahead and give some categories here. Let's go ahead and rate ourselves on some different categories. If I were to write down the word marketing, rate yourself on a scale of one to 10 about your knowledge in that particular sector. Uh, let's go ahead and write down a word salesmanship. Do I think I'm pretty good at talking to people? Uh, let's go ahead and I think a good test of salesmanship would be, can you show people less than, you want to say 10 houses, John, and they make a decision. Yeah. If you're showing on average 20, 30, 40 homes to people, you have something to learn in the area of salesmanship. And uh, there's so many different classes that both John teaches and I teach on being better in that particular arena. The guys on our team, I know, love that stuff, and we do a lot of practice on trying to, to, to help people be better in that area. So go ahead and write down salesmanship and rate yourself, one to ten. Uh, let's go ahead and, and give another category. What about business systems or software that helps me run my business? Uh, John, what other categories can we throw in there that we can rate ourselves on? Uh, negotiations. Negotiation, that's a great category. If we find ourselves losing out in multiple offer situations, if we find ourselves losing out in just regular negotiations, um, if we're consistently not getting what we think we could get, can you evaluate yourself and say, you know what, uh, when I list a house, I'm actually selling it at about, right now the market average, we just looked this up, it's about 92% of uh, People are accepting 92% of what they list at, right? Is that correct, John? 94%. 94%. Okay. So they're going on average 6% below what they're asking, and your average is significantly higher. I think you were above 100% uh, through, through uh, January and February, right? Uh, actually, it's 96% for the market, but 104%. Okay. And you're at 104. Yeah. That's a drastic difference in amount of money that you're able to give to your seller, which is another amazing value proposition and, and probably why you get a lot of calls from sellers. So why well, don't you write that down as negotiation? Team, though. The team is doing awesome. That's, that's not just me. That These guys are just rocking and rolling and uh, they're following the system. They're okay. following the scripts and, uh, and it, the number shows. The number shows. Yes. Yeah. Um, what are some other things we can put on that list? Um, follow maybe up. follow up. Follow up is a fantastic F one. You money. What's F that? You money. Follow F you up. money. That's right. Uh, and most agents are really bad at follow up, right? Right. Follow up. I All right. So rate yourself on a scale of one to ten. What about personally? What about your personal life when you take a look at relationships? You take a look at um, your mindset. Can you rate yourself on your mindset? Can you rate yourself uh, on how you are in relationship, because if not, uh, you know, there was a portion of my life where I, I think I read every uh, relationship book that there was trying to understand and learn how to be better in relationship. Um, uh, spiritually, there was a time in my life where I went through every book I could find, uh, you know, a book, you know, following some of these people out there like um, uh, Brennan Manning and Henry Cloud and learning from these guys, just uh, their outlook on life, trying to have a better grounding so I could rate myself higher in certain situations. So I think this is a great time for that. We can yes. sit on uh, uh, YouTube, on Facebook and watch videos, but you know, that gets kind of old, don't you think? <laughs> we can only watch so many of those until we go ahead and, and uh, spend the time digging in to learn the things that we want to learn.
Yep. And we, right. if you don't identify it, you're never going to get better. That's, that's true. I, that, that's what I've learned. Mm -hmm. If you don't know what you don't know and you don't identify it, you're never going to get better at, better at it. So right. like really the first step in improving, improving your life and creating a magnificent life is identifying where the gaps are. Right. And that's both in business and, and, and in life too. Mm -hmm. So like in life for me was identifying and accepting that I was unhealthy and, okay. and then changing my whole life approach, um, you know, finding mentors who can mm -hmm. get me healthier. And I'm not, I'm not talking about just uh, like uh, coaches and, and trainers. I'm talking about just like changing my whole lifestyle so that I become healthier. Mm -hmm. you, know? uh, you, you could even be talking about healthier um, from an eating standpoint. Correct. Okay. You know, taking a look at, you know, I had to do that at one point and recognize that most everything I ate was fried <laughs> and it was on a bun. <laughs> uh, uh, Love the Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A, they knew me by name in there. I, I, I didn't go there for two months and walk in the door and I go, Brian, where you been? <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to stay away from uh, eating fried food with every single meal. And uh, that was, a, you know, something that made me feel better as a person. And I dropped 10 pounds, so. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, what are those things that you want to be better at? Go ahead and write those down and then come up with a specific game plan. And that generally starts by finding just the resource that you're going to learn from. It might be one book, might be two, it might be several, it might be reading articles. But I would say if you're on this call, go ahead and write down this as a goal for yourself. Put it on a piece of paper that you're going to print, put it in a frame. Um, promise yourself you're going to read one chapter of a book every day. Um, I didn't go to college. That decision changed the course of my future. It was my college. My college was in the books that I read, and I promised myself I'm going to read one chapter of a book every single day. Uh, as of right now, uh, I am going through, John and I both are going through with a group of um, agents, uh, the top 20 business thinking leadership uh, marketing books that we recommend and we are reading a chapter a day and going through in a year all 20 books and uh, we've got a mastermind around that that's something that you know um, John you want to speak a little bit to being um, how did your life change when you kind of came into uh, changing your mindset to be in a constant state of evolving a constant state of learning and growing I think it's, uh, it's, it's changed a lot. And like, you know, I'm looking back like the last couple of years and where I am today, I'm, I'm glad that um, my mindset changed and, and, uh, and I just wanted to keep on growing and learning and, you know, where we are today, you know, with, with the current market condition, um, I am so glad that I made a commitment to myself uh, a year or two ago to, uh, to just learn and, and be in proximity to people who know things and in proximity to powerful people so that uh, their attitude and their mindset would rub off on me. And so I'm, I'm super grateful that, you know, we as a team where we are today, uh, at least I had the, the chance to, to change my mindset so that we, we all can be here together. Right. So that's good. It's a definite mindset change to determine what I want to learn and headed that way. And that leads me really to my next point on here. And that is partnerships. The power of the people that you associate with is very important. So who are you partnering with, coaching with, or mentoring with? Every single person that would like to get to another level in business has to have that person. And it's pretty fascinating, John. I was talking with somebody a couple of weeks ago, and they were talking about, well, I have a mentor. And this person had done about uh, five deals in their first year in real estate and, you know, kind of were moving forward. But the mentor that they were working with only was closing around 18 to 20. So really, what does that mean? That person probably has the capacity to take them as far as they are. And the question really is, who are you learning from? If you're learning from somebody who's slightly above you, you can get a little bit more knowledge. But uh, who are the people that you started hanging around with to be able to elevate your game? Because there was a point where you were only closing five deals and it wasn't that terribly long ago, right? We're talking about 2013. Uh, yeah. 20, 2010. 2010. Okay. 2010, you were doing five deals a year yeah. to be able to do hundreds per year right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were some people you started hanging around with and learning from. 
So coaching, mentoring, what are, what are your suggestions for people on that? So a few years ago, um, I say two years ago, I was, I was a guest speaker at a, at a conference or a real estate mastermind. And I remember stepping off the stage and the next speaker came on, you know, on the microphone and he said, um, who are you modeling yourself after today? And that was the first, that was his opening line. And I'm still walking down the stage. And I thought to myself, like, who am I modeling myself after? You know, and, and before I sat down, I realized why our business a couple of years ago had, had hit a wall and we were stagnant and we weren't growing as fast as I wanted to. Uh, because at that point, I realized that um, I had been modeling somebody whose business wasn't growing. And so, and and I had already exceeded the person I was modeling. Like we were already like more productive and more profitable than that other team that I was trying to model after. So at that point, I started to ask myself a different question. Uh, whose business can I model my business after? Whose business is big enough that I can, you know, model myself after that other business or that other individual and actually I won't have to change models like immediately. Um, and so I identified Tony Robbins. I'm like, what if, I can just get in proximity to Tony because Tony and like, I love everything Tony does. You know, I love what he's, what he stands for. I love that he has a heart for giving and I love that, that he loves to change people's lives and inspire people. And so I'm like, what if I just model my, myself and my business after what Tony Robbins does? And, you know, and, and so right now I'm, I'm still coaching and mentoring with Tony Robbins. Um, I, I have a business coach in Craig Proctor and Todd Walters. Um, so for me, it's, it's so crucial. Like if your business isn't growing, ask yourself that same question. Like, who are you actually modeling yourself after today? Mm -hmm. um, when, I, when I was at my most unhealthy state, I asked myself the same question. Who am I hanging around, hanging around with today? And I realized everybody that I was hanging around with was also unhealthy. And then so when I changed my peer group and I'm like, all right, I want to be healthy. I want to be alive. I want to I wanna feel great again. I want to have energy. I changed my peer group. I changed the people that I was hanging around with. When I was selling five homes a year, I looked around my circle and guess what? The average of the people that I was surrounding myself with was selling five homes a year because I didn't feel I was good enough to hang around people who were selling 20 homes a year. So I had to get over myself and actually just be like, you know what, forget it. I'm gonna hang around people who are selling 20 homes a year. And then my business sold and then I, I started selling 20. Then when I was like, you know, my new goal is 100 homes a year. Who do I hang around with then? I found people, I found agents, business owners who are selling homes at that same rate. And so then my business took off. When we, hold, when we hit 100, so uh, who do I hang around with now? Because we already averaged the five people that we surround ourselves with and the quality of our business, the quality of, of our real estate career is directly proportional to the expectations of our peer group. So if your peer group, if our peer group is okay with you selling one home every other month, guess what? You're okay with that too. But if you surround yourself with people who's like, you know what, you gotta sell five homes a month. Otherwise you don't fit in here. I guarantee you, your own expectations will change. Your standards will change. So look around you. If you're not happy with one part of your life today, who are you surrounding yourself with? Because you are influenced by those people. That's good. That's fantastic. And you know what, before this is over today, I think we're going to be talking uh, uh, for about another 30 minutes or so. I want to talk about fear-based uh, marketing a little bit because I've got some good tips for you on that, but you're going to be getting a text and that text will have a, just a short little uh, uh, questionnaire on the things that we covered today. And there's going to be a button that says, um, I'd like to talk with John or Brian just to get a free business consult. John and I, want to give of our time, our resources, and our energy to help agents out. And um, um, you can just check on that and we'd be happy to spend some time in, in a web room just like this so that we can keep our social distancing. Uh, so just watch for that text to come through. Uh, so that leads me over to fear-based marketing. So when we're understanding what people respond to, it kind of starts with the two great motivators that exist. And John, uh, I actually, uh, both of us learned this kind of from uh, Tony Robbins, didn't we? Yes. Two things that motivate people more than anything else. You want to share them? You know, people, uh, they're influenced by, they try to, most people try to avoid pain. 
They mm-hmm. try to avoid pain. And that's a very powerful motivator for most people. Then there are people who are uh, who's trying to, to obtain joy and happiness. But the pain, avoiding pain is always more powerful. Uh, for example, if people decide to buy a home, it's because not owning a home is too painful. They may be like, oh, it, I can see the great, the happiness that's going to come with buying a home. But a lot of times the thing that pushes them over the edge is it's just too painful to stay the same. When you decide to buy a car, right? I, I, one of my business partners just bought a car. He just upgraded to a Mercedes, to a Benz. And um, it's also the same thing. Yeah, the, the idea of driving the, the new car is great, but staying the same was too painful. So a lot of people are influenced by those two things. Actually, everybody's influenced by that. They want to avoid the pain of being the same or staying the same or whatever the pain is. And they want to obtain happiness or joy or pleasure uh, at the same time. And when people make decisions, it's based on the combination of the two. So that, that's actually leading us into a, a principle that exists here that is really uh, basic but very powerful. Well, when I talk to an agent and, I, and let's say they have a question, Brian, I can't get this buyer to buy a house. And I say, uh, uh, why are they moving? And an, an agent generally says, well, they want a three bedroom, two bath in such and such area. So that did not answer the question. That's, that's, actually, that's actually not why they're moving. Yes. So it's very important to, to dig in a little bit deeper so we can find out, are they moving because it's a search for greater pleasure? And are they, or are they moving because there's a lot of pain where they currently are? Uh, mm-hmm. What are those things? So um, I know that uh, we've, we had a fantastic uh, all-day training session with your team members not too long ago where we actually role-played this and then we practice it for a long time. What are the kind of questions that you try to ask the people to try to dig in? And questions lead to more questions lead to more questions. Isn't that correct? Yeah, and, and you think it's like a complicated question. It's a very simple question. Why are you moving? Mm-hmm. Why? You, you have to find the why. Why are you moving? Why do you need to move? Why is that important to you? So depending on what the answer or what the answer is, you just take it one step deeper. Oh, so you want a finished basement. What's, what's, uh, what's with the finished basement? Why is that important? Oh, you so want, why like, is that important? Yeah, why I is like that? that question. Yesterday we had a, we had a consult with a, with a doctor who's moving into our area, wants to move to Bethesda. And he gave me his budget and he's like, I want to, I want to have a fence in backyard. And I'm like, okay, that's cool. Uh, tell me more. Like, why is a fence in backyard important? And he starts telling me, oh yeah, I have a, I have a lab. I have a black lab and um, we want to get a second one. And I, me being a dog owner myself, I know my dog needs a fence in backyard. But the important thing from that conversation was not the fence in backyard. It was the backyard. It doesn't have to be fenced in. So it was the additional question, like why is the fence in backyard important that identified that it actually opened up the conversation now where he's more comfortable because, you know, when you're talking to people, there are certain topics when they're talking about specific topics where they start to, to, uh, to smile. Mm-hmm. Right. And so when we start talking about his black lab, he started to glow. I'm like, Oh, he loves his lab. Yeah. Right. We want to spend time and talk and acknowledge the things that our clients love. And also I identify the things that they're afraid of, deadly afraid of mm-hmm. so that we can use that. And, and, oh gosh, I don't remember the exact quote, but if you know people's biggest fears and if you know what they love and if you can solve those two things in real estate or in any industry, you're going to have a successful business. That's all it is. A really successful business is just solving people's biggest fears and giving people what they really truly love. Mm -hmm. That's it. So what questions do they have or what problems do they have that you can solve? It, 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 everybody on this call should write that down. That is a massive major key to every single person you'll ever talk to, whether you do business with them or not, whether they're buying a house or not, whether they're selling a house or not. Every conversation that you have really starts with what is making this person tick? What are their needs? And can I be a resource in assisting them in some way through this? Because, uh, it's, because it's different ahead. than like, if we're just a real estate agent, one among what, 31,000 in the state, in the DC metro area, 
Mm -hmm. uh, we're just one among many. But if we make that connection where they can truly feel and honestly believe that we understood them because we identified their biggest need, not just their biggest wants, but their biggest fears. What's the actual fear? What's the actual pain? And what's the actual love and joy, the pleasure and the pain? If we can identify those two factors, people will feel like they understand you, that you understand them. Right. Yeah, and then, you know, as the, of course, it's said often, but once they understand or feel that you care about solving their problems, that's when they truly start to, to get buy-in and believe in uh, what you've got going on. They really don't care how much you know, which most agents bring a resource of knowledge to the table, yeah. but they don't bring enough of uh, the other side, which is, hey, I totally, we're on the same page. And you can't get on the same page unless you ask those ask extra questions. Exactly, exactly. People don't care how much you know yeah. until they know how much you care. Right. That's a big belief. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I even like, like when you're thinking about what are the things you love to do with your dogs? You know, yeah. because cause what if a dog park or a, a walking trail, those kind of things are the things that would, he'd probably get another big smile on his face if I found right. him a house near one of those, even if it didn't have the fence yard, right? Right. And also now identifying that, oh, the, the two black labs are important to him. Then when we're showing houses, even though he didn't bring up, oh, I want to be close to a dog park or I want to be close to this or that feature, it's in the back of our mind. Hey, this is a great home because, not just because of the home, but look, the location's great. Look, there's a dog, there's a trail right behind here. Your dogs are going to love this. Your dogs are going to love this, uh, yeah. this location, yeah. right? So that's crucial. That really just leads us into the uh, problem, solution, and benefit. So let's kind of wrap up this conversation with thinking about every time we're talking with somebody, we're trying to find out what their questions are or what their problems are, how we can use our resources, our time and our energy, our knowledge to help uh, solve those. And then once it's not just about us solving them, it's about how their life is now benefited, how it's better, faster, stronger. Uh, that kind of just lets us jump over into how to cut costs. Now that we've talked about a fear-based society, let's kind of finish up on this. And there's uh, John, um, I, I know you've done the same thing, but years ago, if anybody does have, um, uh, I don't see any questions coming into the chat room. So maybe John and I are explaining things really clearly. If there's something that you'd like to ask about the current crisis, the current pandemic, uh, well, from a business standpoint, I don't think John and I are, either of us are virologists. Uh, I did stay at a Holiday Inn once, but I'm not a virologist. <laughs> so um, you do remember that commercial series, right? No. I'm not an expert, but I did stay at a Holiday Inn once. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Yes, yes, that was a good series. Mm -hmm. You always remember a good marketing campaign. Um, so let's, um, years ago in... Um, I hear this all the time when we're talking about budgeting with real estate agents. Real estate agents say, well, I can't have a budget because I don't have a monthly income. But we do have somewhat of a predictable income. We understand, you know, some deals may fall through, but it's more of a, to me, a reverse budget. So my strategy for putting a budget together uh, as a commissioned salesperson has always been to take a look at First off, what are all my expenses? Can we go ahead and get all the expenses put out and then go ahead and have a second category? What are all the expenditures? Those are two different things. Expenses are expenses, they're hard costs, they're my rent, it's my car, it's my real estate license, my continuing education, my key to get in and out of houses. Uh, you can, uh, you know, just the hard costs that we have to have, those are expenses expenditures is what I'm spending outside of that. So there's a big difference between going out and, um, you know, spending a hundred dollars at Roost Chris for dinner and, you know, eating a peanut butter sandwich at home. You know, Roost Chris is a, an expenditure. It's a luxury at specific times. So if I can start to understand how much I'm spending in each category, I can actually predict when to either tighten the nozzle and shut it down a little bit or open it up and say, hey, we can, we can have a few more expenditures. Now, from that point, it just comes, let's go ahead and say, I get a commission check for, 
let's go ahead and say $10,000. After I get to uh, pay my broker, do everything else, I get a check for $10,000. If I'm looking at that $10,000 and I just looked at my expenses, how long can I make this $10,000 last? That was a question I started asking huh, in the first recession I was ever in. Every time something came in, I looked at how long can I make it last based on those and you cut off all of the um, expenditures that aren't absolutely necessary. You know, the, the spigot gets turned all the way down. Um, the second way to look at this, and John, I'd kind of like your input. You have uh, quite a few employees. You have a lot of admins. You have a lot of agents. Uh, you have staff members. Uh, you have an operations manager, a leads manager. Um, what are you doing to look at your overall budget and look to trim or, or cut costs? How, how do you kind of approach it from the cost standpoint? Because I understand uh, your marketing, you've, you've uh, cut back certain percentages on some things and cut some other ones completely off, right? Right. So I look at it the same way uh, the governor looked at it. <laughs> What's essential? Mm -hmm. right? What is the most essential things that we need uh, in order for us to operate on a day-to-day -day basis and still serve our clients? Because we have a mission. Our mission is pretty much is to serve big, to change lives, and to make a difference. And our, our mission, if you sum it up, is to, uh, to create raving fans. Mm -hmm. So who's essential to create raving fans? And that's the first question I ask myself. And then how much marketing do we need to actually still have raving fans? Right? And we also look at how much leads we have in place. What do we have? Do we have enough leads for the next couple of months? Do we need to spend uh, the same 100% of what we were doing before uh, if the market is if it, and what we're looking at also is how much are other agents spending, right? If all the other agents are dropping out and they're not spending marketing dollars because they're all afraid, then I don't need to spend 100% of what I used to either to make the same amount of noise because there's less competition marketing against me. So that's, those are the two things I looked at is um, if I reduce my, my marketing budget, how much can I reduce it by without sounding less loud than before? Mm -hmm. and still making the same amount of impact because there's less competition. And number two is um, which departments are the most essential right now? Do we need 100% of uh, strength on those departments or can any of those departments uh, and also our staff and assistants, if any of them um, can be reduced? Mm -hmm. So I think we're looking at, and, and if you have some questions, please do ask some specifics, but um, I think we're giving some basic foundational things here. Uh, I do have to say uh, that the average real estate agent that I have mentored or coached with did not even have a budget. And I'm going to go ahead and say that less than 10%. And that's going to go in the category of some people are C personality types and they want a budget on everything. Uh, some people were raised that way where they had a budget, but most real estate agents aren't extremely organized. <laughs> we can all testify to that. Uh, so having an understanding of what your expenditures are versus your expenses is really the first step. So set aside some time. Anytime you have something like this, that's a good tip. Go ahead and get on your calendar and start being calendar oriented. I talked about reading a chapter of a book a day, put it on your calendar every evening at 9 p.m. from 9 to 9.30. It really only takes about anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes to read a chapter of a book, depending on how fast you read. And then you can sit and think about it, maybe journal a little bit. Um, what are the things you want to learn? Put it on the calendar. Second, set aside some time to go ahead and look at your credit card statements or whatever. Uh, maybe you have one card that you use for your business and start looking in one for personal. I'm not sure how you do it. Start looking at all of those costs and get them categorized to see what it is that you're actually spending in each category so that when something like this happens, you have more control. Uh, anything else to add to that, John? No, I think that's, you know, that's pretty much what I would say. Just make okay. sure you know what you can control and which, and focus on the things that are really things that you can control. Right. Okay. Um, the last thing that I want to share here is really, uh, John, you've, uh, kind of taken a look at across the, the scope here of real estate agents and said, you know what, if you could help out in any way, you'd like to have a conversation with agents. So that's kind of one reason we're calling out a bailout. If you need help in cutting your monthly costs or your costs to your broker, we, we'd like to have that conversation with you and discuss some sort of, uh, you know, options as far as if uh, you could help out with some of those costs and just open that conversation. Uh, I, know, I know that 
you are the kind of person that just is looking to uh, to make our industry and the place that we work something that's long lasting for a lot of people and you have a great desire to help other people and uh, anything to add to that? Um, also with uh, if, if you need uh, leads and appointments, you know, mm -hmm. the, we're always looking for agents. Okay. Mm -hmm. So on a couple of different fronts there, those are the things we want to uh, discuss with you. So uh, watch for the text that you've got coming over. And on that text, uh, you're going to have the opportunity to just check a little box that says, yes, I would like to spend a little bit of time with either John or Brian to uh, discuss either some getting some more uh, appointments, some more leads, um, or uh, helping to reduce uh, some of the costs that you currently have. Well, if not, thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, John, thanks for what you had to share, the, the tips on, uh, on the market and things to do in this uh, downtime. And uh, hopefully you found it very helpful.